We're now ready to proceed with our news conference. At this time, I'd like to introduce the astronaut crew for the Apollo 11 mission. Lunar module pilot Edwin Aldrin, spacecraft commander Neil Armstrong, and command module pilot Michael Collins. We'll now hear from Neil Armstrong. After a decade of planning and hard work, we're willing and ready to attempt to achieve our national goal. This is possible because very many Americans across the nation have dedicated themselves to quality craftsmanship and ingenuity. We're dependent, too, on the successes of the previous flights. The unmanned flights and the manned flights, Apollos 7, 8, 9, and 10, whose crews have done a magnificent job of preparing the way for us. I'm sure this American ingenuity and American craftsmanship has given us the best equipment that can be made available. And we're very happy to be ready to fly. I guess we are we're ready for your questions. Thank you, Neil. We have a panel here of four newsmen who will ask questions of the astronauts this evening. These four panelists are representative of the more than 3,000 newsmen who are here to cover the Apollo 11 launch at the Kennedy Space Center. The first question we'll have from Mr. Walter Cronkite of CBS News. Well, gentlemen, uh, out there at the Merritt Island, you all look very relaxed, and I assume that you're all quite confident. But I remember, Colonel Aldrin, that at uh, Houston at a news conference last week, you had some concern that the public might be a little overconfident. You suggested that the shouting ought to come after the mission and not before it. Uh, do you feel that the public is putting too much hope on this landing on July 20th? I feel that uh, we're seeing about the uh, type of uh, reaction that, that many of us were hoping for, and that is a, a very enthusiastic public that uh, has great confidence in uh, what our nation stands for and what our uh, space program's aims have been and what we hope to, uh, to carry out in a few days for that American public. Do you, uh, do you think, uh, Colonel Aldrin, that perhaps uh, uh, we ought to use if a little more in, in describing the flight, the timeline here, instead of, say, when you land on the moon? Uh, are there still a uh, lot of unknown quantities in this thing? Oh, I, don't, I don't believe so, Walter. I think uh, we're quite uh, able to use the term uh, when. Uh, we certainly uh, are thinking positively. We've been thinking positively over the past uh, many years in, in preparing for this flight. And of course, in the last uh, several months, uh, everything that we've been doing has been very positive uh, in its nature. And uh, no, I, I think we're quite well um, suited to, uh, to say when we land, not if. Next question from Mr. Al Rossiter, Jr. of United Press International. Mr. Armstrong, there has been some concern in the past about Apollo crews becoming too fatigued by intense training in the final weeks before launch. How do you uh, feel at this point in time? Well, it's uh, uh, certainly uh, a uh, very hard preparation time in getting ready for flight, and, uh, and we have been uh, working hard ever since our assignment to this uh, Apollo 11. Uh, However, uh, our pace has, has certainly not been unreasonable, and, uh, and we think uh, that uh, we're certainly not unduly fatigued, and we're ready to fly. Next question from Mr. Everett Clark of Newsweek Magazine. I'd like to ask Michael Collins, the forgotten man of Apollo 11, if he can tell us exactly what he thinks, what he expects to be doing up in that command module at the time mm -hmm that uh, Neil Armstrong steps out on the lunar surface? Well, primarily just tending the store, Mr. Clark. Uh, as you may realize, the command module is a very 
complex vehicle and uh, just to do nothing inside it requires uh, a good deal of switch throwing and a certain amount of attention. So I expect to uh, be keeping the command module ready for Neil and Buzz's return the next day and I'll be uh, quite busy doing that. Next question from Mr. Joel Shurkin of Reuters. This is from Mr. Armstrong. There's been speculation about what the first man on the moon will say when he gets there. Will you prepare something ahead of time, or will it be, pre be prepared for you, or can we expect a spontaneous exclamation? Well, certainly nothing has been prepared uh, for me, and our, our uh, attention uh, during the training period and up till, till now has been focused on uh, how to do the job and how to do it best, and not so much with what might be the emotions of the moment. I think that would be uh, impossible to predict, and uh, so I do not plan uh, to, to uh, guess at this point what my uh, emotions might dictate, if anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think perhaps the, the highlight for for those of us uh, in the limb, uh, will probably be a successful touchdown. Uh, I, I really look forward to that uh, the most this time. Mr. Cronkite? Uh, Neil Armstrong, I'd like to explore that a little further. I, I'm sure that old boy uh, will be a, a, an understandable reaction when you put down there, but uh, the world probably is expecting a little something more than that. Magazines have done articles about it, and there's great speculation. You must have had thousands upon thousands of suggestions, and some of them from some pretty high places, haven't you? Well, we certainly have had uh, a large amount of, of mail from uh, very uh, interested uh, public, and uh, it's very it's great pleasure for us to uh, find that uh, that the public is uh, so interested in the in the details of the of the uh, program and, and its various facets. Uh, I think this is one that, uh, area that's probably captured uh, the imagination of the uh, many people that uh, are uh, better prepared to to look at this sort of subject and than we are, but uh, we really haven't had the, the time or opportunity to give those suggestions uh, uh, the attention they're due. Haven't the uh, public relations people suggested anything to you, Neil? No, they haven't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Rossiter? Uh, Colonel Aldrin, uh, would you be satisfied if you just achieved a successful landing and takeoff, but uh, for some reason could not step out on the lunar surface and collect the first uh, samples of the moon rock. Well, I, I think it's been uh, fairly clearly stated that, uh, that we're going to feel that uh, we've accomplished a successful mission if we land men on the moon and return them safely. And I believe that uh, is the primary mission uh, as stated. We would like to add as much as we possibly can to this. Uh, for the return from this flight and also to maximize the uh, benefits that uh, will be able to be obtained from uh, uh, previous or the uh, succeeding flights. We'd like to uh, solve as many of their problems ahead of time and give them as much advice uh, on how to uh, get more return for our uh, lunar flights. Mr. Clark. Well, uh, Colonel Aldrin, following that up, the Russians have Luna 15 on the way to the moon. And uh, there's some speculation anyway that it might be on its way up to scoop up a sample of the moon and bring it back. Uh, you're assuming a, a pretty good flight rather than just a landing and immediate takeoff, uh, and you're hoping to get samples. If the Russians scooped some of this up automatically and brought it back so that they retrieved the first samples of the moon, would, would you feel a disappointment? I'm sure that all of us would. Uh, we'd like to uh, return with everything that we've set out to do on this flight. Uh, I think the, uh, the Russians are to be uh, congratulated on their uh, launching. 
Uh, of course, I don't have any more information or perhaps a good bit less information than, than many of you people as to what the uh, objectives are of this flight. Uh, they have uh, been rather congratulatory on, on our successes in the past, and uh, I think that, uh, that uh, we feel the same way. We wish them uh, the most success that they can have, and we hope that they uh, have and share the same wishes toward our uh, flights. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, if Luna 15 turned out to be a lunar orbiter, and it was in an orbit that uh, gave us any concern about possible conflict with our orbit, do we have the fuel budget, the extra fuel that we would need to vary our orbit, and uh, or could that would that uh, make you miss your landing site? That's. Uh a very difficult question to answer. I think the probabilities are uh, nearly infinitesimal that that would be an actual case. We have uh, very many uh, objects in space orbiting the Earth at this time, and yet we don't concern ourselves with not launching into Earth orbit uh, in order to leave for the moon. Mr. Shurkin. It's from Mr. Collins. What four events in the flight, in order if you can, do you consider the most dangerous? Well, I don't know. The most dangerous items are those that we've uh, overlooked and not uh, devoted enough attention to in our preparations. And, of course, uh, I have no idea at this time what, if any, they may be. I hope there are none. Mr. Cronkite? I would just pass a note here. As you gentlemen probably know out there at uh, Merritt Island, a large part of the press is, is here in front of our desk, uh, and we represent all of them and a very noted Italian uh, lady journalist and interviewer, Oriana Falacci, asked a question in direct line with that. Uh, could, uh, could you describe your emotions as regard that prime human emotion of fear? Uh, do you harbor any fear, or, would, or how would you describe your attitude just before flight? Any one of you, or all, <laughs> well, well, I, I certainly wouldn't say. Draw straws. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, say, uh, Walter, that fear is an unknown emotion to us. Uh, uh, fear is uh, is uh, characteristic, uh, particularly of uh, of uh, a knowledge that there may be uh, something uh, that you haven't thought of and feel that you uh, would might be unable to cope with. Uh, I think our, our, our training and, and all, the, all the work that goes into the preparation for flight uh, does uh, everything it can toward their erasing those kinds of possibilities. And uh, I, I would say that uh, as a crew, uh, we, uh, we, among the three of us, really have uh, no fear of launching out on this expedition. Mr. Rossiter? Along those same lines, uh, Mr. Armstrong, I've heard that uh, your mission has been given by some people an 80% chance of total mission success. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, are those the rough general figures that you would go come up with? Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot of statistics at hand, but I, I think that's a reasonable estimate. That's in terms of mission success. Uh, that is accomplishing everything we set out to do. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's a reasonable estimate. Certainly our, our chance of, uh, of safety is, is far greater than that. Mr. Clark? A uh, question for Mr. Collins. If the uh, lunar module gets off the surface and back into an orbit that is lower than 50,000 feet, it seems to me you would probably try to bring the command module down to rescue it. Can you tell us what the absolute minimum is, what the lowest altitude to which you could bring the command module is for a, a sort of a rescue of the limb? Well, you're very close to the limit when you say 50,000 feet, uh, given the fact that some mountains are probably in the vicinity of 20 or 30,000 feet high we would uh, be prepared to go down to the absolute limit, and it would uh, be a decision that would be reached by mission control based on uh, 
their best d data on what it orbit uh, the limb was in and how low it would be necessary for me to go uh, to effect a successful uh, rescue, and uh, I'm sure I'd be happy to abide by their decision. My guess would be it would be somewhat less than 50,000, but not very much less. Mr. Shurkin? For Mr. Aldrin, is there anything about the lunar module that bothers you? Do you think NASA could have made it sturdier or maybe put springs on the bottom or? Uh, no, there's nothing that I can think of that uh, that concerns me. We, we would always like to have a little bit more uh, fuel, but I think that uh, that's a natural reaction of a pilot uh, to uh, have a little bit of extra protection uh, stashed away in the hip pocket. Uh, we feel uh, that there is much confidence in the, uh, in the uh, delta V or the uh, fuel margins that are available. And certainly uh, throughout descent, we uh, We'll be very closely monitoring these as will uh, the emission control. And uh, we feel that uh, it is quite uh, a natural thing and, and should be quite easy for uh, both the mission control and for us on board to be able to identify any uh, potential shortcomings in the uh, LEM systems. And uh, there'll be many, many people looking at uh, each and every bit of telemetry that comes back to the Earth. And uh, there will be thousands of people on call to uh, give advice, should any be needed. Uh, I, I feel very confident in this uh, vehicle. I think it's done a very good job in the uh, two previous flights. And I certainly feel that it's, it's ready to perform this mission, which it was uh, initially designed for. Mr. Cronkite? Having come this far down the road toward putting men on the moon, you men in, in particular, uh, do you see any, any other approach to accomplishing this than the one we've taken? Looking back eight years and knowing what we know now, might we have done this better, more efficiently than we've done it? Well, as, as you know, Walter, uh, all the three major approaches to the lunar landing strategy, that is the one that used the rocket to go directly to the moon and the same vehicle to fly back. Second strategy that used uh, assembly of vehicles from various launches in Earth orbit and then thence uh, an expedition to the moon and return. And the final uh, method, the one that was chosen, uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous, wherein uh, a vehicle, the vehicle combination is sent to the moon and then one section detached and sent down to the lunar surface are all capable of, uh, of doing the job. I think uh, those of us uh, that have participated in the development of the Apollo uh, spacecraft and the rendezvous techniques necessary to, uh, to make that a realistic way of going between uh, the moon and and the earth believe that it's uh, the best way uh, certainly was the one that was uh, promised to be the least expensive and the, the one that would use the less the least time and uh, uh, we're very comfortable with uh, this one of, of several approaches that that would have worked mr rossiter uh, mr armstrong on apollo 9 we had a red rover call sign during his spacewalk uh, how do you and Colonel Aldrin plan to refer to your, yourselves uh, doing your EVA? Uh, we just expect to use our names. Mr. Clark? Uh, this is for Neil Armstrong. Um, you, can't pr you can't make a landing on the moon without going there, as we keep being reminded. And yet you have to practice it as nearly as possible. And you do this with simulators of various kinds. I guess you even uh, flew a helicopter the other day, maybe as a, as a warm-up. How do you feel about the fidelity of these simulators? In other words, how, how close do you feel you have come now to having really practiced what you, you're going to face next Sunday? Well, our, our simulators are, are amazing devices. They uh, give unbelievably uh, good fidelity uh, in terms of the cockpit, the scenes you see out the window, and the responses to your maneuvers and engine thrusting and so on. Uh, 
we've also been very fortunate and they've given us very good reliability in past months and it has been the thing that has made the preparation of the crew possible uh, for launching this summer. Uh, simulators can always be better, however, and uh, I'm quite certain that when we actually uh, get into the flight environment, we'll find uh, a lot of things that are they're different than uh, they were in the simulator. Has your crew had as much uh, simulator time now as the uh, 9 crew and the 10 crew did? I, uh, I don't have the numbers available to me, but I suspect they're very comparable. Mr. Shurkin. This is for anyone who cares to answer it. The Russians seem to feel that machines can do almost everything a man can. Why are you going? Why are we sending men and not machines? Well, I think we believe that uh, men can do many of the things that, that machines can do, that uh, an adequate or a, uh, a uh, reasonable uh, mixing of the two to accomplish missions in space is, uh, is required, and we must uh, learn where each type of a mission has its place. Certainly in the exploration of the moon, both types can be used quite well, as uh, uh, we've evidenced from the surveyor program. It's uh, given us amazing results. Uh, we feel that there are many things that uh, uh, rely on judgment on the spot, and uh, we feel that uh, this is where the uh, manned flights uh, Will, will really come to their own in, in the future. Mr. Cronkite? Uh, gentlemen, I understand that everybody uh, out there at Merritt Island and here, well, is a little tired of, uh, of this problem that came up in the last couple of days, but it's a matter of the president not uh, or being disinvited to come down after he was invited by you to be present. And uh, at a news conference this afternoon, uh, Dr. Charles Berry had a, one more word on the matter. He said that uh, uh, he repeated what he said before about the need for the uh, medical security for you gentlemen, and that applied to the president as well. But he also said he did not know whether it would be beneficial for the president to have seen the crew before liftoff psychologically. Uh, I wonder, if you, uh, some of your colleagues have felt that it would have been beneficial. Neil? Well, I, I uh, certainly uh, uh, wouldn't attempt to uh, make judgments in preventive medicine or uh, fields of those kinds with which I'm not an expert. It would have been a great pleasure for us to, uh, to see the president, uh, and it was very kind of him to uh, offer to, jo to join us uh, for, uh, for dinner. I look forward to... to uh, in him sometime after the flight. Mr. Rossiter? Colonel Collins, uh, you will be flying the command module alone for some 28 hours, I believe, around the moon. Uh, do you expect any difficulties in flying solo for that length of time? I believe it's the longest time the command module has been flown solo. No, I really don't, Mr. Rossiter. Uh, of course, Dave Scott before me and also John Young have uh, done precisely the things which I must do. It's going to take me a little bit longer to do them, but I don't think that uh, is especially germane. I do have one complaint, however, I'd like to, to point out to uh, those of you, particularly in the television business, that uh, I have uh, no TV set on board, and therefore I'm going to be one of the few Americans who's not going to be able to see the, the EVA, so I, I'd like you to save the tapes for me, please. I'd like to look at them after the play. <laughs> Mr. Clark? Uh, this is for Colonel Aldrin, uh, but it really is for all three of you if you care to answer it. I wonder if you're as tense for your own flight as you are when you're waiting for other astronauts to go up. Uh, for example, Apollos 7, 8, 9, and 10. Do you feel any more uh, excited or, or uh, uptight for your own flight than you do for other people's? Well, there's, there's no doubt that uh, when, when you're lying on your back on top of the, the mighty Saturn V that uh, there's a different feeling than, than when you look up and, and see one of your compatriots uh, doing the same thing. 
I, I think I would uh, maybe sum up my feelings in, in a word of uh, anticipation. This is what, to me, uh, characterizes uh, my feelings right now as I look forward to the next uh, few days. Mr. Shurkin? This is for anyone who cares to answer. Do you think NASA made a mistake in the early days when they planned Apollo for not planning for a rescue, the capability of rescuing you in case you have come into trouble? I, I, I certainly don't. I think that uh, a rescue mission at this time is uh, uh, beyond uh, our state of ability, certainly beyond our financial ability to uh, to fund, and I think the approach that was taken, namely building the, spa the safety into the spacecraft, is the proper one for this uh, stage of spacecraft development. Mr. Cronkite? Uh, Neil, uh, we heard earlier, after the flight of Apollo 10, that unless uh, you found the answer to the wild gyrations uh, and the firing of the ascent stage, uh, uh, the LEM, during that flight, uh, that uh, you wouldn't go, and yet uh, we haven't heard that you've solved the wild gyration problem. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing about that? I, I think we understand uh, the nature of the, of the uh, difficulty that came up with the Apollo 10, even though we, we, don't, we cannot pre precisely ascribe the difficulty to a certain uh, failure. And uh, our procedure is one uh, where we have procedurally uh, uh, implemented methods uh, of circumventing the problem. And should it occur, we have uh, procedures that will uh, uh, be able to, uh, to cancel the kind of uh, problem we might get in. Mr. Rossiter? Mr. Armstrong, you and uh, Colonel Aldrin are going to be on the moon for almost a day. Do you? expect to be able to sleep during your rest periods in the lunar module? Well, I don't know about those. I suspect I'll be uh, uh, surprised if I'm able to get sound sleep on the lunar surface. But uh, fortunately, our flight plan doesn't, uh, doesn't require that. Uh, we have uh, adequate rest on both the night before and the night after the one in question. and. Uh, I think even if uh, my worst suspicions are true, we'll be in fine shape. We have time for one final question. Mr. Clark? You have what amounts to a day off tomorrow. What, is a, what do three men who are about to go to the moon and uh, make a landing do with a day off? They crack that, Mike. Well, I plan to sleep, lie in the sun, and uh, read the flight plan again. That completes the conference. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and good luck from everybody here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.